Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to all our online students as well. Let's uh, pray, and we will start. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you that we could get together like this and study and learn. And as we share this information, as we learn, we pray that our hearts will be strengthened in you, uh, that our love for you, our love for your word, our love for your truth will grow and increase and be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we started talking about the Bible, how the Bible came to us, and uh, and this, we still have some quite a bit of ground to cover. But just very quickly, I want to summarize some of the things we saw last week, which is in talking about the reliability of the Scriptures. How can we say, the scriptures are reliable, the text. There are two things. What are the two things? Time gap and number of manuscripts. Number of manuscripts and the time gap. So the shorter the time gap, that means the closer we are to when the text was originally written. And the more manuscripts, it enables us to validate that the text is correct. Like if all the copies are saying the same thing, then it's like, hey, this text is correct. Right? But if, if you have five manuscripts and all the five are saying something different, you don't know which one is correct. It will be a big problem. Right? So in both these criteria, the Bible is way ahead of all the other ancient texts. Our time gap, is, like when you're talking about the Old Testament, is down to like 150 years. That's on page 48. The New Testament is down to over 50 years. You know, that's very, very good. Very close to the original. And the number of manuscripts in different parts of the world and, you know, from those early records, we have thousands of them, not ten or hundreds, thousands of manuscripts. So it's very good. We can verify, cross-check. And that's why even in the Bible, you'll find some footnotes saying, okay, some early manuscripts say this, or you know, some something just telling us that okay, there may be a slight variation, but in essence, the text is accurate. This is the same thing said. And all the manuscripts. So very reliable. Because you're, you're talking about thousands of manuscripts. Not 10 or 20 or 100. Thousands. They're all saying the same thing. Right? So, uh, so we move forward from that page 49. Uh, I just, again, I'm not going to go into details of this. I'm just mentioning this. One is, uh, the Lord Jesus himself affirmed the authority of the Old Testament. So Jesus, in his for his own personal life, he used the Old Testament, right? We know when the devil came to tempt Jesus, he quoted the Old Testament. He said, "It is written." He said all the temptations, and we can say that you know every temptation Jesus faced, he would have done the same thing. He used the Old Testament scriptures, and when he was teaching, even to his own disciples. He quoted from all oh, from Moses through the law, through the prophets, through the Psalms. He pointed out the scripture speaking of himself. And after his resurrection, when he was walking with the disciples, he quoted from the Old Testament. He pointed back time and time again to the Old Testament. So even Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. Now keep this in mind, and we'll talk about this, uh, you know, a little bit when Jesus was born and when he lived on the earth by that time the 39 books of what we refer to as the 39 books of the old testament they were all assembled and those were considered the sacred scriptures by the time 
जीजस के ओके सो व्हाट वी कॉल एज द ओल्ड टेस्टमेंट दैट टाइम इट वाज इन कॉल द ओल्ड टेस्टमेंट इट वाज जस्ट द ज्यूइश स्क्रिप्चर्स बट द सेम 39 बुक्स दे कंसीडर्ड एज सेक्रेट scriptures that is what they kept there were a lot of other writings a lot of other things but they didn't consider all the other writings or other historical things as sacred scriptures only these 39 books they already kept and we will see why right and jesus referred to those scriptures he didn't quote from other texts right he only quoted from these scriptures you understand it? so the old testament as we know it the old testament these 39 books were considered sacred by the time jesus came and jesus himself referenced those 39 books in his preaching and his teaching for his own personal life right now um accuracy let's mention a little bit uh, accuracy inerrancy of the bible so uh when people say oh there are some problems here problems there in the text our response one there are our response is twofold one is the law of non contradiction that means uh, you see this in the old testament you see this in the new testament where the same story may be recorded slightly differently in say kings and chronicles in the old testament same story same incident may be recorded slightly differently or in the new testament in the gospels same incident will be recorded slightly differently so people say ah oh, look there's a problem but actually it's not a problem so let's take a practical example suppose in the morning at 9:00 uh, i met two people i met john and i met paul then 12 o'clock i met another person i met uh, peter then 3 o'clock i met somebody and i told them today i met john and peter is it correct or not it's it is correct because morning 9 o'clock i met john and paul 12 o'clock i also met peter and 3 o'clock i'm telling somebody i met john and peter it is true i actually met three people but i'm only mentioning names of two but it is correct i did meet john i did meet peter i left out the name of paul but it is not false then i met somebody else i said today i met peter that is also true i actually met john paul and peter but i am only telling him i met peter that is also true it is not wrong just that i didn't give the full story i didn't say i met john i met paul and i met peter i am just say i met peter it's true so and i met meet somebody else and i might say i met john paul and peter today that is also true because i did meet john paul and peter so these three statements are not contradictory right if i tell somebody i met peter it is true if i tell somebody i met john and peter that is true if i tell somebody i met john paul and peter that is also true they are not contradictory the information contained is different none of it is false and they are not contradictory so that is where you know when we see in the old testament or new testament certain events recorded but it is not exactly same so what is it nothing wrong just that in one place more information or less information may be given about the same event but it is not contradictory both are true so even in the gospels we'll see things like this so it's not thing it's just that one writer wrote focusing on one part another writer wrote focusing on another part it is fine 
Okay, so like that, we are able to explain what may seem like contradictions, but actually it's not a contradiction. Also, another thing is usually when you study and research sufficient background information, you'll find that things are easier to understand. You know, like if you read on the surface, oh, I don't understand. Okay, you study a little bit, you do some research, you'll understand it, it'll become clearer. Okay, now let's go to page 50, uh, just quickly to explain how did we get the canon of scripture? How did we get the 66 books? Right. And uh, I've given all the content here. I'll just summarize it. So first of all, the Old Testament. Old Testament has 39 books. How did these 39 books get assembled? Like who put it? So it was a, there is no one person who decided to put these 39 books. It didn't happen like that. Or what happened? As the prophet spoke, their writings were kept as sacred. So first was Moses. So what Moses spoke, his words were transmitted. Initially it was transmitted orally, and then it was recorded for us. So these are the words of Moses. So record it. And in the beginning, it was not written in chapter and verse. So that came only in 1560 AD or something, more recent. Chapter and verse was not there. It was written like a, like a book. OK, so keep in mind, in the beginning, everything was written like a book, not chapter and verse. Chapter and verse came only around 1500, 1560 or something. Correct year is there. So in the beginning, as the prophet spoke, what they spoke was written, and it was considered sacred by the Jews, by the people, because it was a prophet who spoke. So it was kept sacred. And other, of course, other people would write other things, but they were not considered sacred because that was not by a prophet. Okay, so slowly this collection of sac sacred books, which were the words of people who were recognized as prophets, were kept. Right? Were there other books at that time? Yeah, people were writing other things, but they were not taken as sacred. So by the time we come to 400 BC, that is Malachi, Malachi was the last recognized prophet. So you say, why you stop? Why the Old Testament stops with Malachi, which is 400 years before Jesus? Because he was the last recognized prophet. So the criteria was who is speaking? Is he a recognized prophet of God? Because those words were considered sacred by the Jewish people. And only those scriptures were kept as sacred. So that is how we get our 39 books of the Old Testament. The writings that were considered sacred because they were spoken or written by the prophets. That was considered. There were a lot of other books. But that was not from the mouth of prophets. So that is why... Example, somebody asked, why don't you consider the Apocrypha in the Bible? Catholics are having it. There's a difference. Because these 39 books were considered sacred, spoken, written, or given through the prophets. That's why. Apocrypha are other writings. And like that, there were many other writings which were not considered sacred. So we also don't consider it sacred. If you want to consider it as literature, yeah. Like that, there's so many other writings. But we are not interested in literature. We are interested in sacred books. And these 39 books were considered sacred. And the last known prophet was Malachi. So it stopped at Malachi. So from that time, from 400 BC, 
only these 39 books were used by the Jewish people, considered sacred, that's all. Now, of course, based on these 39 books, they wrote their own laws. Like they would make the, the Pharisees would write their interpretation. Oh, you keep all, they came up with, I don't know what number, like 700, 800 rules they came up with based on these scriptures. But that is not considered sacred. It is only what they are interpreting as. So like that, they had all these rules. People were following them, but it was not considered sacred. It's not given by the prophet. It is this man is interpreting this. Okay, you follow the rules, but this is only 39 books are considered sacred. So when the Lord Jesus came, these 39 books were already there, spoken by the prophets, sacred, and even Jesus read from it and he quoted it. He didn't challenge, oh, take out this book, put that book, <laughs> nothing. He also followed. Then, when we come into the New Testament, so the church was born, even the apostles referred to these 39 books in their preaching and teaching. So right on the day of Pentecost, Peter is quoting from Joel. That is part of the Old Testament, what we call Old Testament, or the Jewish scripture. From there, pointing to Jesus. So Paul, in his writing, quoting uh, Peter or others in their writing, in the epistles, they are quoting from these 39 books. You understand it? Now, how did these 27 books of the New Testament get put together? What was the criteria? Right? So you'll find that on page... Uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, Ezra, the priest, was very instrumental in preserving the collection of the Old Testament. So we're not saying Ezra put it together. It was already there. Many of them were before him. But as a scribe, he was very instrumental in copying and preserving it, You know, especially when uh, uh, the Babylonians came to destroy it and all that. God, God used him to preserve the text and all. So he's, he's very important from that perspective. Malachi, the last prophet, page 52. Uh, yeah. So um, when we come to the New Testament scripture, um, first of all, we, the early church, they looked at what were the writings of the apostles. Right? Not anybody else who wrote. What were the writings of the apostles or those who followed Jesus closely? Right? So that was very important. So we know that James uh, uh, was the half-brother of Jesus. He, he wrote James, Peter, John, the beloved. Uh, then those who followed Jesus closely. John Mark wrote Mark, but he got it directly from those who followed Jesus. Paul was an apostle, recognized. You know, he wasn't the twelve one of, among the twelve, but he was recognized as an apostle in the early church. So his writings, right? So the early church, although there were many writings, many people wrote many things, the collection of works written by these apostles was what was considered as sacred text. So by the uh, by early 30 to 100 AD, uh, they received revelation, they wrote them down. Then the next generation, which is from 100 to 150 AD, they were looking at what was written by the apostles. Those we will consider as sacred, not things written by other people. So there were others, historians, others who were writing things. They left them as history books. They didn't put them in as sacred scripture. Okay, And then by the time, I think uh, yeah, around 350 AD, so we are talking about 
250 years after John, after the last apostle. So John, the last apostle, died around 1980, by the end of the first 100 years. By the time we come from two, about 250 years later, many of the leaders at that time, they began to recognize only these 27 books as the works of the apostles. So you have, we have a list of all these people. Um, the council or the synod of Laodicea, that means these are the leaders, church leaders in Laodicea, um, the bishop of Alexandria, uh, Jerome, who translated it into Latin, St. Augustine, the Council of Pope, Council of Carthage. That means these are, council means a group of leaders in that city. Right? So it became almost a unanimous decision among the leaders in these various cities where there were churches, that these 27 books are what we will recognize as scriptures, because they are known to be given to us through the apostles. So then, these 27 scriptures, along with the 39 books of the Old Testament became what we call as the Bible. Hmm? The Bible means simply the books. The books referring to the 66 books. The books, the Bible, the books. So the books are 66 books, 39, 27, the books. Right? So they started using this term around that you know, by 350 AD, it became a common thing. The books, Bible, 39 plus 27, that is what we are referring to as the Bible. So, no one person sat and decided. The Old Testament happened through a, you know, through a community of Jewish people, through that community who recognized the prophets, who recognized that these were the sacred words they kept it together of course god used like in the old testament main person is ezra preserve it from destruction new testament they wrote but it was many leaders in many churches who eventually recognized these are the 27 books that are written by the apostles which we will follow and by 250, 350 AD, 250 years later, it was given the term Bible, the books, these books are what they call. So from that time till now, we are following it. And what we believe is that God's hand was involved in making this collection come together. Because no one person sat down and said, I will decide. You know, you see, it was many leaders, many places who recognized these are the 27 books. That's what we will put in the Bible, the collection. Right? So we believe God's hand was there in putting these books together for us. So the reliability, authenticity, we understand from the number of manuscripts and the time gap. The canonization, meaning the collection of these 66 books, we understand as a sovereign work of God through the community of believers. Old Testament, New Testament. God sovereignly put it together, and that is what we have. And we are not going to add to it or take out of it. Finished. It's closed. So today, where people say, add the Apocrypha, so you want to add it, you add it, I'm not adding it. For me, these 66 books are the canon of Scripture. Got it, no? Any questions? Sorry, go ahead. There are other apostles also had written their gospel, like Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of uh, the thing, and also, why are those not like mentioned what was the basis because they were with Jesus but they also have given yeah so one is we don't have so 
the other obvious, obvious criteria is, are there works available? You know, like even Paul mentioned, some of his letters have gone missing. Like, I think he mentions in Galatians or one of the epistles, make sure that you read the letter that I've written to Laodicea somewhere else, which is not there anymore. So we don't have it. If we had it, maybe we would have added it. You know, so all we can say is, uh, perhaps whatever was written there is already in the other episodes. Because we see a parallel in some of his episodes, especially Philippians, Colossians, uh, Philipp Ephesians, Philipp Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. There's a parallel, a lot of, you know, similar. So, so to answer to that is like, yeah, there are things which are mentioned, but we don't have copies. So there, there's no way that it could have been added to this collection. And God, in his own plan, felt that no need to it. This is what is there, yeah. Any questions uh, online? Sam, go ahead. Yeah, Pastor, so this, um, I always wondered, like the canon of scripture, right, uh, which is the 66 books, that's like like a big deal. Like, I mean, you know, that is the Bible. Um, and what we mentioned is like uh, there were these group of leaders who kind of decided the canon. Now, over the years, has that been challenged, say, by other Christian leaders, like, say, in the Protestant world or saying, um, or what was decided then is decided in that council? Um, because that's like, yeah, like that's God's word, right? That's what we read. So over the years, um, you know, uh, why do we just decide? Uh, when was it decided that this is the the canon for believers? Yeah, yeah. So, like we saw, um, and I mentioned that I think on what page was that? Um, on page fifty three, um, there are at least about one, two, three, four, five, six. So there were six different groupings of people who all. And this was all around three, the mid, uh, around 350 AD, so 250 years after the last apostle. So around 350 AD, around that time, that these councils all decide, you know, were unanimous in their selection or their recognition, I should say, of these 27 books. So over that 250 year period, People implicitly recognize these 27 writings as authentic and from the apostles. And by the time we come to around 350 AD, uh, these councils in different locations where the church was well established, uh, these group of lead elders in these different places, all recognized that. And that is when things were canonized. It means they were formally put together. Since that time, I think the only challenge would be one was what the Catholic Church did in introducing the Apocrypha, which was a collection of a, another set of books uh, um, in between the inter intertestamental period. When they introduced, of course, you know, um, it was for the Catholic Bible, but again, that brought up a lot of questions and which for which uh, the Protestant church did not accept but they introduced that and they still continue to do it uh, and as Protestants maybe we, re we can read it as literature but not as scripture but that as I would look in answer to your question I would say look that is one kind of a challenge there are people from outside the church who don't recognize the canon of scripture and therefore they challenge the authenticity of various portions. Uh, but they are doing it more as skeptics rather than, uh, you know, as from within the church challenging the canon of scripture. Yeah, so that the skeptics and questions about, you know, the authenticity of whatever scripture we have, that continues to happen. Uh, but from within the church, uh, the Protestant church, I don't know of anyone who's 
challenge the scripture. There, there have been like you know, we are aware of cults who try to replace the scripture. So, for example, the Mormons would come up, came up with you know, okay, this they came up with David. I think his name is David Smith. I think I didn't get his name wrong. Um, uh, so, okay, God, he came up with something else, saying, "Oh, God gave him this revelation," or uh, the Jehovah's Witness, or you know, the Seventh Day Adventists kind of uh, hold in equal, uh, almost in equal to the Bible. They hold uh, the writings of their. Uh, I'm not getting the yeah, name. Uh, of this Joseph name. Smith, Pastor. Uh, that was yeah, sorry, that was Joseph Smith. Correct, that's the correct name. But for the Seventh Day Adventists, um, I forget the name of the, the lady writer. Anyway, so they, so these are like almost like competing with the scriptures, different groups, and some of them we would call as cults because they actually give preference to the writings of these other other writings instead of the scripture itself. But as far as the canon of scripture, there has been no uh, genuine, sufficient challenge within the proper Protestant Church. We have embraced it. We say we accept it because this was decided, you know, around 350 AD, and we stayed with that. Um, yes, Pastor. So the other thing was uh, on the 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 cults, right? Um, I think one thing that we see it's it's one particular individual which is very contrary to how the canon was formed which is right. of people so that's something to keep in mind as well um, sure. like when it's just an individual giving a revelation um like a movement is born but that doesn't mean um yeah yeah just, just yeah. notice that yeah true and then many times um the ideas that are presented uh, contradict what is there in the Bible itself. So, you know, that's a red flag uh, that we see. Yeah. So, it's good for us to kind of know this because sometimes people will ask, you know, hey, how did the Bible, how did you get your Bible? Yeah, so, good to know that it is really something that happened in a very what you say, like a community-driven way, right? Rather than one person deciding, it was just God's hand over 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 centuries in putting these together. Now, we want to move to another aspect of the Bible. is about Bible translation itself, and why do we have so many English? I mean, and I'm speaking mainly in English. I, I don't know about. In other languages may have multiple words. Like I think in Hindi they have three different versions. Bible, three, four, three, at least three different versions. So different languages, you know. But let's just talk about English. English itself has so many versions. So we say, why? You know, why are you having so many versions of the English Bible? How is it done, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, it is good for us to know uh, so that. It's good for our own benefit and also for us to explain to others, you know, why that's uh, why it's like this. So, uh, first of all, uh, in terms of manuscripts, right? That means the collection of original writings of the scripture text. There are two main sets. Uh, basically determined by where or which region of the world they were found. Right? So one is the Alexandrian, which is like the northern Africa in Egypt, Egypt, basically Egypt. So uh, Alexandrian, meaning Alexandria was a capital, was a major city in Egypt. And another one was the Byzantine, uh, another collection of texts. Scripture. So there are two classifications. Okay, these are found here. These were found here. So we have these two big families of manuscripts, and in addition to that, there are two approaches to. Uh, I don't know where I mentioned this somewhere. Um, okay, let me just say it. I don't know where I mentioned it. There are people. 
okay there are two approaches one is there are, there are bibles that will say look we want to present the earliest in time that means for every book in the bible we will translate from what is closest in time to the original that is one approach in time the other approach is we will translate what is most common across manuscripts we are not worried about how close in time they are to the original so when the and usually usually when translation is done it is done by a team of people right in the early days yeah it used to be individuals like jerome was the one who translated the scriptures into latin so latin bible was done by one man he must have sat and done it for long or i think the other translation like tyndale william tyndale uh, translated it into english so early days it used to be like one man sitting and doing it but subsequently it became primarily a team effort so i think today most translations of the bible would be a team effort except i think i, I think again i have to check on this but i uh, the message bible yeah i think the message bible was done by an individual mainly i think his name is some eugene something i forget his name and i got to check on this but generally most bible translations are done by a team of people so the team of people will decide scholars of course they need to know hebrew and greek and aramaic so they will decide what is the approach they're going to take because everything has to follow that same approach they can't do random some books like this some books like that right so they make a decision we're going to go with the earliest in time or the most uh, uniform across manuscripts they make that decision okay and so when you have a bible they will tell you okay this is how this is the texts we used collection of texts we used and this is how the approach was done etc they'll explain how the translation was done in addition to what i've just mentioned the overall philosophy of translation what are the translators trying to achieve in their work so even there there is a there are variations so they have these technical terms that are given there on page 55 one is formal equivalence means a word for word translation that word is translated into english like this word for word every word will be put into english word for word that means you're trying to be as literal as possible but the challenge is that when you bring it in it may not the meaning may not be so obvious to the english reader because the goal is keep it word for word that word i must have the corresponding word or words in english then put it in a meaningful sentence uh, the translator will understand but the reader may not it may not be very apparent it may not be very easy so like the King James or uh, English Standard Version, New American Standard, these are Bibles that are literal, word for word. Then functional equivalence is a thought for thought. What was the thought? I will convey it in words as close to the original thought. Right? Uh, makes it easier to understand. But there's slight interpretation happening. That means the translator is saying, this is the thought I will get across in English. But keep in mind that the writer could have had more than one thought. So sometimes it's possible that there could be a little loss in the translation. Optimal equivalence, are they trying to balance word for word and thought for thought? Uh, the Hoffman Christian Standard Bible, I think it's HCSB, 
is attempting that. I think, yeah. There is the number four, the essential equivalence is meaning for meaning. What was the meaning? I'll try to put it here. But the problem is interpretation is already happening. Right? The translator is understanding, saying, okay, this is what he meant, or this is what I think he meant. And I will put it here, and I want you to understand this. So I'm getting the meaning across to you. But there is a little interpretation, trans, uh, interpretation based on the translators happening. Equ essential equivalence, like the passion translation. What's your view on this message translation? Ah, so the message translation comes in the last one, which is more of a paraphrase. Yeah, it's okay to read, but to study, it is better to go with number one. Uh, I will explain that. I'll explain that. So the paraphrase is where the goal of the translators is, let's make it very easy for modern day readers. Let us put it in modern day language. Let's not worry about you know the exact text and the language. You know? Let's put it in, make it easy, and actually paraphrasing it, like a summary of it. So now we are even further withdrawn from the original text. But the goal is, let's make it easy for the modern day reader. Let's make it relevant. Let's make it, um, let's capture the attention of the modern day reader. Let's almost say the same thing in modern day language. That is the goal. All right. So the intention in each of these is good, but they are serving a different purpose. So I think this little visual on page 56 is, is it helps us understand. You see, on the left side, uh, word for word, that will be that's close to the original. So the best is the interlinear. That means like Greek, here's the English, here's a you know, just word for word. Then you have other versions like American, Amplified, ESV, KJV, NKJV, right? They're all in that word for word category. And, you know, they've taken slight liberties in what words, what English words they use for the original Hebrew or Greek word. You know? Then you have the thought for thought. You have uh, NIV, which would be what, you know, many people use. And then you have uh, uh, meaning for meaning will come right after that, which is the passion translation. And then you have the paraphrase, the living Bible, message Bible, good news Bible, uh, contemporary English version. All these are kind of in that paraphrase. And the one you see far right is the message Bible, which means the goal is to make it interesting and relevant for the modern day reader. We are not so interested in keeping following strictly the original text written by the authors, the original writers. They're all serving the purpose. So when should you use what? And how do you use so many different versions? Uh, when somebody who wants to just read something very light, uh, you know, OK, you can tell them, yeah, Message Bible, Living Bible, that way you can start. At least they get started. Easy. But when you want to study scripture, serious student, go as close to the original as possible. Go as close to the original. Right? So for us, when you want to study, you want to know what was the what was actually said, what was the what was in the mind of the writer, and what was, go as close to the original. And then you compare with other versions. So what I do is and we'll talk about it tomorrow, the tools we can use to try to really get to the original text, because we want to know what was originally stated, so that our preaching and teaching is accurate. I don't want to end up preaching and teaching something that's wrong. Right? So go as close to the original text as possible. Study that. Get that meaning. 
then use other versions, English versions, to help you communicate that in a language that will be relevant to people, as long as you're staying true to the original meaning. Sometimes you read Message Bible, you say, hey, this is far from the original meaning. It can totally it'll be something totally different. And then it's okay, I won't go close to it. So in an attempt to be contemporary, it's like really gone far away from what was originally being stated, right? So that's that's kind of the danger there. So uh, the way we should do it is start with us, especially when you want to preach and teach the word, start with the word as word for word, as close to the original, understand that properly. Then you look at other versions, look at how was it, how it is stated in some other versions so that the goal is to know how to communicate that in ways that are relevant for modern audience, that the other versions will help us. Can I show you how to do that tomorrow? How basically how I, I try to do it. Uh, I'm not saying this is the best way, the only way, but this is how I practice it. And I'll share, share that with you tomorrow. So the Amplified, you find that is it's word for word. So what Amplified Bible is trying to do, it's trying to capture all of the possible meanings and put it there for you. Yeah, so you can then say, yeah, oh, it also means this and that, you know, especially in the New Testament. The Old Testament is not so much, but in the New Testament, and so it's useful to study. Sorry? Uh, it's useful for studying, but when you're preaching, uh, if you're reading the Amplified Bible, it makes it a very distraction for the audience. Uh, yeah, because you'll read one word and re read that meaning of that word and yeah, like you know, multiple meanings. It, it's a little distracting for the audience. You can use it to quote it here and there, but if you're like really reading a lot of passage, it becomes like this. So, for example, you know, the, in in the Amplified, uh, sorry, the word Parakletos, right? Uh, the New King James will just say Comforter, or King James will say Comforter. Amplified will say. Comforter bracket and it'll give you all the other meanings. You know, it's a, a advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. It'll give you like basically the seven meanings of that one word. It'll put it there in bracket. So all is there. So in one way, it's nice to know that hey, parakletos means these seven things. So it's good for study. But when you're reading it out in, in public, uh, they'll be like, oh, what is he saying? You know, because it makes it kind of long and lengthy. Um, yeah. Okay, let's stop here. We'll continue this tomorrow. And uh, I didn't give any time for questions, but uh, we will pick up some questions on this. And uh, I will share with you basically how we study the scriptures. Okay. Uh, Gertrude, do you have a question? No, Pastor. Oh, okay. Okay, you're just raising your hand. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll pause here for today. We'll continue this tomorrow. Thank you. Bye now.